presentation today will be a little focused on some of those practicalities and things that uh, I've observed in that transition. Um, so it's going to be pretty high level. Uh, this is not uh, an academic talk. Um, I'm gonna speak probably more broadly in themes, but I will be showing examples of uh, projects that we've worked on. And um, so I hope that this provides a nice counterpoint uh, as well to um, some of the great things that are going on in uh, on, on the academic side in neuroinformatics. Um, by the way, uh, I'll be at uh, the INCF meeting in Montreal here in a few weeks. And so I hope that uh, some of you that are on the line will uh, meet me there and uh, I'll be able to catch up uh, in Montreal. So um, with regards to today's topic, this it's really, uh, I wanna kind of walk through uh, some observations that I made uh, as I've gone through the process of building this company that is focused on making neuroscience data available and working with neuroscience models. And because it is a pretty high level talk, I'm, I'm gonna use some really high level themes of visualize, collaborate, and build. And um, I do mean these in pretty specific ways. So um, yeah, when, as I talk about visualizations, I'll be talking about why visualizations are valuable and also uh, touch on a little bit on, on why they can be technically difficult to implement and specifically in terms of understanding the nervous system. Collaborations, obviously, collaborations are great, but I mean in the specific sense, the ways in which um, collaborations around neuroscience data um, that have been integrated with each other um, create uh, opportunities to better understand the nervous system. And then build, build is the, the part that's, uh, that uh, everyone always uh, leaves off, which is the hard work required to really operationalize um, any software system or data management system in neuroscience and make it robust and um, make sure that uh, people can continue to use it uh, year in and year out. And so I'll speak a little bit about some of those practical things that, uh, uh, that, I've, that I've confronted. So uh, a little bit more about the company, Metacells, uh, at the intersection of neuroscience and information technology. It's a really great place to be. Um, we put neuroscience data online as well as models. Um, and we believe that what's most interesting about that is when you combine data together, you share it online, um, you integrate multimodal data sets, you really unlock its potential. Um, and so for us being able to add analytics and um, to be able to deal with very large data sets, um, to be able to pull them into a, in a visualization environment very quickly and be able to learn about what insights are in those data are, is really what gets us up in the morning uh, and what's really exciting there. So we work across um, the web, um, we, we build native apps, we build mobile apps. Um, one of the things that sets us apart from other software companies is that we do understand the science. Um, we have scientific backgrounds. Um, myself, um, you know, have, have gone through training in computer science, worked in software engineering, um, went to graduate school in neuroscience and, and neuroinformatics and computational neuroscience specifically. So we, we kind of understand the questions that get asked in that space more than a, you know, a regular software company. And so we really can jump in understanding the scientific questions that are going to get asked um, and how then to turn that into software requirements and use cases. Um, so we're really cross-trained in that. Um, I'm not the only person in our organization uh, with, with strong cross-training. Uh, in, in both sides, both on the software side and on the uh, neuroscience side, experimental neuroscience side. And, um, and we really work with a project all the way from inception to delivery, meaning that you know, we have to be on top of managing the project. And that means not only working with resources inside our own organization, but also working with resources in our partner organizations. Um, and we tend to do that through uh, agile development processes um, we work continuously um, in feedback loops uh, with our clients and we find that works much better than just running away and building a product and then <laughs> delivering it um, without uh, much input. Um, and as Anita mentioned, we really have been honored with a diversity of customers over time. So today's talk, I'm really, the reason I'm showing this is because today's talk is really gathering insights from working across the 
the pretty significant gap and divide uh, from the academic side to the industry side. Um, the common theme is neuroscience data. And people ask me all the time when I say, oh, you work with neuroscience data, what kind? And really the answer is all of it. Um, our projects have taken us from you know, imaging, uh, MRIs, uh, pet images, uh, to you know, functional work, uh, EEGs, uh, so we were human level data, model organism level data. Um, we've worked with microscopy images, electrophysiology data, um, you know, clinical data, clinical endpoints, um, you know, data about um, what's happening with the nervous system during movement. We work with wearable devices that are trying to get at neuroscientific questions. Um, you know, we've recently been compiling our own internal lists of all the data types that we found inside neuroscience. And, you know, I know within, you know, the PsyCrunch environment, MIF environment, uh, cataloging, you know, these data types is something that, um, you know, is, is probably the best authoritative reference in the world for our company internally. We're just sort of compiling lists of data types that we've worked with. And there's definitely over a hundred, uh, when you really start narrowing it down. So a crop from from uh, working with single labs all the way up to really large pharma companies. The major theme is neuroscience data and the research questions that people wanna ask using uh, neuroscience data. So even after all this time and my transition into industry, I can safely say that I'm still inspired by the mystery of the brain and truly understanding it. Um, Anita mentioned uh, I also do research into uh, some of the fundamental principles of information processing in, um, in C. elegans, a small worm a model organism. Uh, I won't be talking as much about that, uh, although I'm happy to come back and, and speak at great length about uh, what I do over at OpenWorm. Um, but here, um, I think what's exciting about the industry side is uh, recognizing how important tools are and how important uh, tools that work really well are to combining multimodal data sets um, to help us better understand the brain and to ask a lot better questions about the brain. So, you know, this here, obviously, artist rendition um, of the brain, but I like to show it um, even though it's not literal data because it just helps to re-inspire me and refocus me on the vision um, of, of what we, you know, are trying to achieve through all these data collection um, about the nervous system is really we're trying to understand what it's doing. Um, and if the brain is a computer, how is it computing? Uh, and that, and, and, and really none of the data by themselves uh, can tell us that. It really requires us at minimum to understand that data in our own minds and build a, a model in our heads of what the nervous system is doing. And I don't know what your you know, internal mental model is of the brain, but mine, something like this picture, um, when you're looking at it at the you know, gross anatomical level. Um, uh, but we've really found that computers are the next best thing to building that picture in your mind and are, are a really critical, important component of assembling those diverse data sets, none of which have the whole picture into some kind of a unified whole. And you get to that through modeling and you get to that through math and you get to, to, to that through a lot of different methods. But, you know, tools, you know, if the tools aren't very good, um, there's a limit uh, as to what you can do. And tools really move us forward and software tools um, very much so. Uh, um, so, of course, there's, uh, you know, multiple levels and multiple modalities. And so our, our, the diversity of our data reflect the diversity of our understanding. And again, another artist rendition not actual data, you know, in, in some ways inaccurate. But again, um, it's important to keep these levels in mind because we're trying to create these synthetic understandings of the nervous system. And, you know, again, your mental picture of the cell level, the neuron level, you know, might look something like this. And understanding the subcellular level is, is also critical. So these, these um, artist visualizations uh, help to inspire. Um, but let's, you know, but we need more than that. We need more than pretty pictures. We need more than, than these static pictures. Um, and so we've had this focus um, in MetaCell about, you know, building applications that do have rich visualization components here. So hopefully um, the animation here isn't too choppy for you on the web. But um, 
this is um, some software that we built uh, in collaboration with um, our partners at State University of New York. Um, this is a next generation um, visualization using uh, modern uh, you know, web tools um, to show a simulation built on top of the neuron simulation environment from Yale University. Um, and here we're looking at uh, a computational model of a single neuron that is based on real morphology. And in this visualization, a lot of things are going on. Uh, I think the thing your eye is drawn to the most, the most colorful thing in the center is the three-dimensional view of the neuron that's there. Um, and as it rotates around and changes colors in these nice flashy ways, um, you know, you, you kind of start to get a sense of what might be happening in this system. Um, and I think that's really powerful because these data are mysterious uh, and um, I think no single graph tells the whole story. Um, but it also helps you in, in the case of a computational model to see things that might be, that might need additional investigation. So, you know, why is it that there's only, you know, essentially one major, uh, you know, axonal unit here that lights up uh, when, when this uh, membrane is firing, when the cell, cell body is firing? Uh, what's up with the patches there that aren't uh, lighting up in the same color? And is there something wrong with the model or is there something right with the model that um, isn't intuitive? Um, so in a picture, um, there's a lot that, that can happen. And then of course, around the edges here are these two dimensional panels that are giving us information about time, that are giving us the ability to, uh, to have knobs to turn and buttons to press uh, to, to make this uh, system work. So um, these kinds of visualizations are very powerful, um, but they're also challenging to build. So um, it's flashing along the screen here on the bottom every so often is talking a little bit about uh, the platform that we build this on. So um, we uh, built uh, an open source platform and essentially the community around something that's called Geppetto, um, remains open source. It's essentially a combination of the best in breed open source visualization environments that we found out there, things like 3JS and D3, things for making uh, uh, really nice web-based visualizations. But um, to hook them together in the right way for neuroscience and really for big data approaches requires a significant amount of engineering, um, things that you usually don't think about like compression, um, web sockets, uh, really driving the ability of the web browser to the max. Um, so a lot of non-trivial connection points to also put an interface on top of this. So, um, uh, so visualizations like this, um, while valuable as I was mentioning, are also not easy to roll on your own. Um, starting with something like Geppetto gives you uh, a step up. You basically start on the third floor of the building and can work up from there rather than starting on the ground floor every time. Uh, and we found open source is a really great way to engage um, a groups, um, either if they're a customer or just a, just a partner or a collaborator, um, because it's, uh, it, it really breaks down the barriers to collaboration and, and sharing. So um, just a couple of thoughts about, you know, visualization here, obviously we're, we're um, combining morphology with time varying data. Um, that's another important thing by the changing of the color. We're seeing a three dimensional shape uh, and we're seeing the membrane potential of that shape um, as, it, as it evolves in time. That's just sort of two modalities or three modalities, I guess, um, if you take you know, space, time and, and membrane potential. Um, all combined together in a way that yes, you know, you, you can make two-dimensional graphs or you know, you can read a uh, you know data sheet or something to see that, but it it's um, it engages our intuitions when we can combine data together in this way. And and we're just looking at a single cell here. <clears throat> so let's let's now zoom out and uh, let's put that single cell in the context of a brain. Um, so while you're seeing a visualization now, which may look kind of similar. Um, actually, we're getting an overlap of a gene expression pattern that's kind of in peach or pink um, with the background of a cell that uh, when it's selected, it's in yellow, and when it's not selected, it's in blue. But now we've jumped into another tool. Um, so this is a project that we've been working on now for several years with a group that's called the Virtual Fly Brain. It's a, it's a consortium uh, that combines uh, groups from EMBL, EBI, 
uh, University of Edinburgh and other partners together to um, integrate the diverse data sets for the Drosophila brain. And this includes gene expression uh, data, this includes atlases of uh, the Drosophila brain, uh, and includes segmented neurons. Um, so while there's no stimulation happening here, as you saw before in the neuron UI, uh, the reason that this probably has a similar look and feel is because this is also a Geppetto-powered application. So again, building on that third floor and working up, uh, instead of you know, doing modeling here, we've, we've reapplied uh, very similar technologies to the challenge of integrating data uh, for a model organism uh, for the purposes of human exploration, rather, uh, you know, just hum human ex exploring the data sets, um, not trying to build a model uh, in this particular case, uh, a, a dynamic model, I should say. Um, and there's other stuff going on. So um, other, uh, so uh, you see this wireframe structure, we're zooming in and out. Um, you might be able to tell that that's the uh, boundaries of the, the, of the Drosophila brain. Um, you can see the different parts of those, uh, the different regions are colored. They can be selected and made active or made yellow um, as, we, as we zoom out and we click on them. Um, and then on the right-hand panel, uh, there's, there's more information that's coming from there. Um, you can see some uh, individual raw data that comes from uh, some, some slice images that uh, have been derived from gene expression studies, from microscopy studies. Um, and on the bottom corner, you see the panel. So up here is the, the raw data I'm referring to. And then down in the bottom corner, you can see the currently active brain regions that are visible on the three-dimensional integrated view. And in between, uh, you're getting a readout that's coming from the ontology system that uh, is tracking this data behind the scenes and several pre-computed relationships between uh, the different entities. So whether it's uh, talking about where a given neuron that you're selected has synaptic terminals, or if it's part of an anatomical region, or what anatomical region it overlaps, or what um, gene expression pattern may be visible. Um, you're, as you're clicking through these uh, three-dimensional objects and visualizing them, you're also getting a detailed readout of uh, where that comes from and, uh, and doing the provenance tracking uh, back to the original source of that data so that you can uh, see uh, where that uh, came from and, uh, and, and uh, look up the initial literature. Uh, you can launch an NBLAST query uh, to find similar neurons from this environment. So it's this very nice integration, um, it, it does have a visualization in the middle of it. Um, but then I, what I'm trying to show here is that there's, it's actually the visualization is a launching off point to a lot of other integrated data sources and services that um, now provide a very powerful way to, um, uh, to do research um, on data that has already uh, been generated and uh, pulled together, and then you know gain new hypotheses and and go and collect a new data set. Um, I can't say that we're fully responsible for everything you see here. Much of the integration work and the ontology work uh, that you're seeing here really has been the product of this you know, really excellent consortium called the Virtual Flybrain. What we've done is we've brought in the visualization uh, and and based on their specifications, built an app that uh, really displays all that all that hard work. Um, uh, in, a, in a nice, pretty way. So we want to make sure that we give credit there for, for what it's due. But uh, again, you know, speaking to the theme of what does it take to understand how the brain works and, um, you know, and, and, and what do we do with all this diverse data, um, we're really finding that visualizations like this as a centerpiece of a data exploration interface um, can be really powerful. Um, and um, it, it provides a really nice unifying framework for things that otherwise are collected with different tools, that have different data pipelines, um, that are really very different things, um, and, and bringing them together. And so, I, I, of course, uh, you know, I, I briefly mentioned the ontologies. You know, that's, that was a big part of my um, uh, education and, and training in graduate school, and so it could, we can't leave them out. Um, that you could do a uh, ontology-based search uh, for data through this system uh, that's based on jumping between anatomical regions, um, specifying what kind of neurons you're interested in and what, what uh, regions they overlap with. Um, you know, one practical thing that we found here is that it's very powerful to focus your user on kind of a canned set of um, question types or question forms 
that you can ask in order to unlock the ability to um, really do some some great search. If you if you let the user ask absolutely any possible thing, it gets very confusing. Um, but uh, so here we have this sort of templated query uh, system where um, you refine your search uh, iteratively, first by starting from a, uh, an entity that you're curious about, and then from there, getting some preset questions of, of what relationships uh, you want to filter on uh, that's uh, specific to the entity that you've chosen. So um, as this thing is uh, looping over and over again, you can kind of see that we start from the query interface, we choose to look for a neuron, uh, on the basis of what anatomical region it overlaps with, and then it pops up in the unified visualization, and then we can see it, and we can see the context of it. So, um, so that's pretty great. So underlying these nice pictures, right, it, it's in a super, super simplified block diagram, what you're really seeing here is uh, the product of taking, you know, what starts as you know, imaging data sets, um, and then ontologies and databases, um, taking the imaging data sets and registering them all together in a common space, um, taking the ontologies and databases and combining that with the spatially registered image data um, and doing you know, what's known as semantic data integration. And then what, you know, what we get with that visualization uh, is the product of all this hard work um, in an environment where we can do now some really nice advanced query and some really nice 3D data display. So the visualization is really kind of the tip of the iceberg underneath a lot of hard work, a lot of hard creation work and essentially informatics work. Um, but again, having the tool work very well um, and it be very clear on what kinds of questions it's asking and making sure that it's robust to answering those questions, um, we found is, is a really critical uh, part of revealing all that work um, that's underneath the surface of the water in the iceberg metaphor. Um, this tool really um, can only uh, work well with this, uh, with this hard work done, but it also in and of itself is a challenging uh, component that, uh, that, requires its own, uh, that requires its own set of effort. Okay, so um, the second point uh, that I wanna touch on comes from the collaborations that are possible. So in the center here, I'm, I'm just recapping this idea of an integrated 3D brain atlas. And I should say that you know, integrated 3D brain atlases is not all that we do in the company. It's um, something we have done a few times and um, is a really nice thing to show. It's kind of a nice metaphor, but there's other kinds of uh, work and applications that, uh, that factor in. Um, you know, and again, just a very small subset of other kinds of data that we see, clinical data, um, simulations that we can put on the web, um, virtual slices that come, you know, at the level of human level data or reconstructed neurons. Um, the diversity of these data sets um, is really enormous. Um, this is why so far we, we find ourselves in a place where every customer that uh, comes to us has sort of a somewhat different set of needs. And, and that's why it's so important that we, we don't just you know, throw a canned solution at them, but actually work with them to understand their needs and, and build um, you know, from the platforms that we have uh, up to the use cases that they have. But the point I'm trying to make under collaboration is, is that visualization tools and really good uh, software tools that integrate data together enable really powerful divisions of labor that I think are going to be critical uh, to unlocking the true potential of neuroscience data and understanding how the brain works. So this overly complicated diagram, not really intended to uh, walk through every piece of it, um, but I'm showing you the complexity actually because of the kinds of interactions. What I like about it is it shows, it gives, starts to give a sense of the kinds of interactions between different uh, human resources and different data and software resources. So um, the premise is that the right tools create the right, create the ability to have the right collaborations and allow people to focus on the things that they're the best at. So one of the things that I learned coming in as a, uh, having a software engineering background and coming into graduate school was that um, I was, uh, I was very popular. People who know how to do things with computers uh, are, very, are very useful people to have in graduate school um, because of all of the potential 
that's possible with you know computer technologies. Nonetheless, um, what's challenging is when you realize that you as one human being need to kind of play so many roles, then you only have so many hours in a day. So you have to both be you know really great at delivering software, and you have to understand everything about um, the experimental protocols of all the data that you're working with, and you have to understand how to map data together in databases, and you have to understand all the database technologies. And then, you know, if you actually want to get a tool out there, you need to understand something about the users, and you need to understand um, the different uh, mathematical things that are out there, and you want to deploy it to the internet, you got to understand internet technology, internet security, you still want your stuff to get hacked. So um, all that I'm, I'm trying to suggest here is that, um, is that, uh, and that part of the process of understanding neuroscience data is having collaborations that are built around software where there's really good boundaries and interfaces between them. So whether it's working on building the atlas and all the steps that go into making you know, a good reference atlas um, using some set of uh, computer tools or build, um, doing reconstructions with other sets of tools or having at the level of software people that are really good at Python programming, it may not be um, uh, you know, experts in, in neuroscience that we have to cl create collaborations like this um, and we have to create um, these divisions of labor in order to make sense of the data. It's an underappreciated point. Um, you look at uh, something like these nice visualizations that I just showed you and it's easy to sort of say like, oh yeah, well, we'll just make one of those. But there's a team behind that um, that uh, builds that and then there's a team that's enabled once um, that uh, software is built uh, that uh, both need to be considered um, in order to make progress here. It's one of those practical concerns that um, you know don't get considered as much, and I, and I think are really important. So to kind of walk through a little bit more as an as an example of what's possible, let me again go back to the neuron UI that I was showing you, and in this sort of sped up um, example of uh, building and constructing a um, theoretical computational model from scratch, again um, using this neuron interface, um, we've got say the person that's doing this. Uh, is somebody who may come from a math background, um, maybe understanding kind of the basics of, say, Hodgkin-Huxley dynamics of a neuron, um, may just be wanting to play around with a theoretical idea. It could also be an experimentalist who's, you know, doing some slice recordings and wants to, you know, check out a, a pretty high-level theory of what might be going on in their in their dish. Um, so then maybe they'd come into the neuron UI and they'd um, start, you know, to build a a model, a multi-compartmental model that, that uh, has some properties that they like. Um, and then maybe they'd start to do their own little virtual electrophysiology in this environment. Um, they might inject a current over here, um, uh, try to see what, what comes out of that, and maybe compare it against what they're having, uh, what they're seeing in the dish, or they may compare it against what they find in the literature. And so environments like this, you see we're sort of very quickly switching back and forth between two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphs to, to get a sense of what's going on. But what I want to focus on is that, so then this person um, maybe is done with their model, or maybe they publish a paper um, on the basis of that model. There's a natural point at which, you know, that uh, work has to be handed off. And um, whether it's for other scientists to review it for publication, whether it's a team member in the same lab, um, or whether it's to somebody who has a very different skill set. Um, you know, maybe it's an electrophysiologist who isn't directly working on the model. Um, collaborations around data are enabled by powerful tools. Um, so here, I've switched into another environment, also built on Geppetto, also the product of another Metacell project that we've been working on for several years, in this case with the University College London. This is called Open Source Brain. It's a very nice resource. Um, this, uh, rather than focusing on the construction of new computational models, this resource is all focused on the sharing of existing computational, uh, neuronal computational models. And so here we're seeing a dynamic visualization in Open Source Brain of taking a model that somebody may have built in Neuron and then uploading it into this environment and then reusing it. Um, and uh, in this environment, you can run uh, new computational experiments that hadn't been run before. Uh, you can try different counterfactuals. You can tweak different variables. Um, you can rotate it around as you like. 
And, and this is kind of the, this is where the magic happens. Uh, and I think, which is when, uh, you know, the work that one scientist has done either with data or model, when it leaves that person's lab and it goes out into the world and it can be interrogated, not just in a publication, but it can be interrogated in a dynamic way um, by another person. Um, that's where these really powerful collaborations can, can happen. Um, somebody may, may be skeptical about how the model works. Well, they can go inspect it. Um, they can play with it. They can change it. Um, and, uh, you know, I can tell you from experience that, that resources like this don't just happen overnight. They don't just get built, you know, by an undergrad um, uh, that, that, you know, one hires. Uh, they, don't, they don't sort of happen, you know, in, in an evening. And there's a big uh, difference from the prototype version of a system like this uh, to the final production version um, that's ready to go, that uh, you know doesn't crash every few months, um, that uh, you know is 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 free from uh, bugs, um, and and can really execute. So that gap between what we'd like to have and actually bringing it into reality, um, you know, is 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 a big is a big challenge. And then there's definitely effort. Uh, that's needed to to pull that sort of thing off, but but we're very um, pleased with this uh, with this kind of uh, approach. And so when when I'm talking about this second theme of collaboration, um, I'm really uh, here just trying to make the hard point of uh, the way that software enables that collaboration and the way that software has to be um, considered in its interoperability to enable those kind of collaborations. So now the computational scientist and the physiologist can have a conversation that they couldn't otherwise have if the tools weren't there to support that. Um, so as I'm gonna transition into the sort of last part of my talk, I'm gonna kind of use this example. I don't know, you know, those, those of you who enjoy exploring the, the world of internet memes may have come across uh, forums where they like to talk about, uh, they like to put back to back with each other um, expectation versus reality. So this is an example of, you know, around Halloween time, what we might imagine uh, we'd like to have, you know, this nice gingerbread house that's sort of scary. And then we go and we get the kit from the store and then we bake the gingerbread and we, you know, uh, we put the frosting on and we make the frosting and we put it all together. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we don't quite hit the target that we were hoping that we would hit and we end up with something that falls short. You know, it looks kind of like, you know, what we want. It's basically, you know, what we were originally intending, but it really lacks, uh, you know, that final 20% that's needed to uh, add the polish to something. And, and this is the space that, you know, we find uh, as a company, we actually want to take that last 20% off of the hands of folks that should more be focused on asking scientific questions, collecting exciting data, um, you know, uh, you know, get, gathering insight. Um, it shouldn't, we, it's kind of our position, it shouldn't be the job of scientists in, in neuroscience to, you know, make the final 20% and refine it or even know how to. Um, that really should be taken over by folks that, you know, have a lot of experience in, in, in that space. So how do you meet, how do you make the expectation meet the reality? Um, it's not, uh, you know, the sexiest topic, but, um, but it's, it's through a well-worn, uh, a well-worn process. It's, um, you know, uh, achievement is in, is produced by persistence more than it's, you know, produced by, you know, raw strength or power, um, employed in a moment. So we think of this as essentially three overlapping areas in order to really build and operationalize uh, systems like this. We think about first process control and standards. Um, that operates at a few levels. That's both at the level of, of teams as well as the, at the level of, of software. Uh, in this space, because we are focused on neuroscience data, we really think that it's critical to deeply understand uh, the neuroscience uh, uh, experiments that have been done to generate data. Every data set you know, only tells a, a part of the story. The, the way that it was collected is, is critical. Um, and finally, you know, combining that with uh, what's uh, at this point, a very solid and robust literature on how one, you know, does software engineering and the best practices that are that are from there. Um, and so the 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 way to really create tools like this and do the last twenty percent means executing on all three, at least uh, at the same time. 
So just to give you a sense from our experience, um, we've uh, worked with groups that start in, you know, this is kind of a pretty common case. So some end user has data that they already have full access to share. Um, we typically don't work as often with folks that uh, don't yet have access to the data. So we're, so that, that makes, there's a whole different set of challenges if, you know, the data are not available to the user, but let's assume for the moment that they are, and that they also have some vision, like the pretty gingerbread house, for how these data will be shared. Um, maybe they have an initial system that already starts to do this. Maybe they have the prototype that the undergrad, you know, created, or, you know, that was created as part of some sort of pilot. And so we tend to work with them to analyze the requirements um, that they have to provide them the kind of functionality that they really need um, that's based on those requirements. And then we build it uh, and we put it online. <laughs> so as a, as a concrete example then to kind of walk through those pieces, um, a project that we wrapped up recently uh, with the Brain Observatory uh, worked with the data of uh, patient HM. Um, so if you're not aware, he's uh, regularly ranks as one of the top two most famous neuroscience patients in history. He was featured in the Oliver Sacks book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, and um, he passed away several years ago, donated his brain to science. And that brain was very carefully processed. Um, and uh, has been made available um, earlier, I think this year, was officially launched on this site, uh, patienthm.org. You can go visit it and, um, and have a look. Um, and in this case, uh, we really uh, worked with this organization all the way from the beginning to the end to uh, make this possible. Uh, the Brain Observatory did have a initial uh, prototype system that they had uh, built uh, quickly. Um, and then um, they got a grant to expand it and, and build a second version. And so, again, we've reused many of the tools and tricks uh, that we've been building over time. Um, while this isn't, there's a portion of this that's built directly on Geppetto and a portion of this which is also built separately uh, in a custom way. And here, rather than integrating the data together in the same visual space, um, we're integrating the data together um, in a way to allow a kind of virtual museum tour through the data sets um, individually and separately from uh, one another. So, um, but here's a chance that, uh, where we got to work with a few different uh, data modalities, um, working with MRI data, um, uh, some of these other tabs have images uh, that came from the gross morphology of the, of the data set. Um, we do have uh, three-dimensional models that were built in there together as well and um, uh, that, are, that are viewable, uh, that were taken from uh, segmentations of the MRIs. And uh, then also virtual slices, uh, histological slices that uh, are easy to zoom in and out on um, and create uh, a lot more insight into what was happening at the cell level um, in this uh, subject's brain. So this is available now for folks to do uh, research on uh, and to better understand what was happening at the anatomical level that gave rise to the very interesting memory uh, pathology that patient HM had. So this is this as a case study for you know what we're talking about. So here the process control and standards that you know that we were really applying is you know methodologies based on really locking down the requirements right from the beginning. Um, understanding, you know, the vision that the Brain Observatory had for this uh, project and, uh, you know, building mock-ups, um, defining the different uh, services that were going to be uh, made available. Um, many of the pieces, for example, the MRI viewer that's here, we evaluated uh, several, uh, I think, half dozen uh, open source libraries uh, for doing MRI viewing. Uh, chose uh, some, contributed back to the development uh, of some of them. So everywhere where there's reuse that's possible, uh, we go and find that um, rather than kind of building our own uh, system from scratch. Um, similarly, uh, we're reusing things from our Geppetto environment. Uh, 3.js, for example, to do the three-dimensional viewing uh, was a big upgrade over uh, what had been there before. Um, and, uh, and working with these virtual slices, we also, again, did a survey of the uh, image viewers 
uh, they had been using like uh, the Google the Google Viewer platform, and we found um, an, another open source solution that worked uh, even better and was uh, much more efficient um, for their use. So that kind of standardization um, there is helpful. Uh, of course, earlier we talked about uh, standardization around ontologies. Um, in this particular example, um, that wasn't as much of a focus of what the, the customer was interested in, but uh, that is something that we do in, in, in cases like the virtual fly brain um, is something that we implement. Um, the neuroscience experimental experience. Uh, again, understanding you know, um, what these different data really are uh, lets us build a system where we can take into account the kind of performance that's needed to view the data, what kinds of questions the researchers are actually going to want to be curious about when they're looking at the data, so the tool is well set up to answer them. That's really critical. Um, and then in the case of the software engineering best practices, there were several aspects of uh, compression that uh, were uh, pretty subtle that needed to be built here, even though these look like they could all be separate you know, web pages to get all these things to load so that you can click back and forth between the, the, different, um, the different data, it's really a pretty challenging web application problem um, to um, uh, not blow up memory, uh, to not have JavaScript crashes. Um, it turns out that you can start to build a system like this um, and make something that looks pretty close pretty quickly, but um, to do that last mile um, is where the real hardcore um, uh, software engineering best practices come into play. And if you haven't been using them from the beginning, um, you, you uh, realize that you painted yourself into a corner and, uh, and you fall short. So I'm quite proud that we delivered that. It's a pretty complicated uh, system. And uh, we'll be having additional webinars to uh, talk about that, I think, uh, by itself in the, in the coming months in the fall. Um, uh, and so uh, check back in and you'll get to see a lot more uh, about that platform. Um, but uh, if you go into patienthm.org, um, you can, uh, I think, just fill out a form and get access to it really quickly. So, so um, to wrap up, um, I've kind of taken a long road here um, through uh, these themes. Um, but um, what all of this is intended to show is, is that while something like software may seem pretty indirect to understanding something as... Uh, you know, philosophically meaningful as uh, the brain and how it works. Um, we're really finding that some of these very practical nuts and bolts issues um, may actually be um, really critical to understanding uh, what's going on with the nervous system and enabling the scientific questions to be asked that are the most important scientific questions to be asked. Um, so all of this uh, code and all of this uh, practical discussion is, is still really aimed at uh, what I've been excited about throughout my career, which is um, this, this deep mystery and um, enabling us to, um, to better uh, unlock it. So just in summary, um, so what I talked to you today about is, is in order to really take greater advantage of the multimodal neuroscience data that we're presented with, it, it really often does require the construction of tools that are designed carefully and are built very well. Um, to, to do it, you just think about in your own practice about how a visualization that's made from that data may help to unlock intuitions about what's really going on inside it. Uh, think about how uh, divisions of labor uh, between different groups could be enabled by having a tool that allows these um, folks from different backgrounds and languages to talk to each other. As we all kind of can speak in a visual language, or we can understand in a visual language sometimes um, and, and, and get us to uh, focus on hard problems um, through visualizations, um, but really building that team is, uh, is critical. And finally, um, the nuts and bolts, the building is um, what makes it all happen. Um, if you don't plan for that uh, in advance, um, the other stuff really can't happen. So um, effective tools come from effective build processes. Um, so um, I wanted to stop there. Um, looks like we've got about 12 minutes left um, and just uh, hand it back over uh, to the hosts and see if there's, there's any questions that I can, I can answer for anybody. So thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, I really appreciate um, the time you've taken here to, um, to let us know some more of the things about Metacell. Um, I'm, quite interested. I didn't know you actually built the uh, 
uh, you worked with uh, uh, the, the Virtual Brain Observatory. Um, that, was, that was a fantastic uh, uh, thing. I, so a, a really small question um, uh, about that. Uh, and you alluded to this in the beginning when there are you know, hundreds of different data types uh, that you deal with. But of course, the, the um, real power of HM is that there are about 50 years uh, uh, of, of behavioral data on patient HM. Do you have any of that linked uh, in, the, um, uh, in this platform or is that available through, um, uh, through this platform? Uh, platform in any way or from the lab? Well, I can only speak to what we did in the scope of our software project, um, but I would um, definitely recommend reaching out to Dr. Jacopo and SA for the final word of all the data holdings that he has. Um, but we, uh, the scope of this uh, system here um, was um, essentially limited to showing the anatomical data. Um, uh, in the main data application. There is another section of the site which I haven't showed as much, which um, does focus on some of the history. Um, so there's some historical uh, discussions. There's discussions about um, uh, the condition that he had and some insights into that. Um, as for um, uh, data that was taken, like sort of raw data that was taken by researchers examining him, uh, that is not integrated into the site um, as of yet, um, although it, you're right, it's a very exciting prospect uh, to consider integrating that in, um, and it would be fascinating to think about actually how to even uh, represent it in the best way. Um, but, uh, but I think that's, uh, you know, that's a place where this can, could potentially go in the future. Uh, that's, that, that's great. Yeah, I, I can chat with Jacobo as he's on campus. <laughs> Um, but uh, the other thing that I, I was interested in, and maybe I should um, allow anyone else to ask questions, but maybe as a, as a way to kind of uh, start us off, what you've kind of grown up doing in terms of your graduate career, um, you know, here with us at, at NIF, um, uh, is really starting to get to that fourth paradigm uh, in science. Uh, and I think that uh, you've really summarized this and, and built this into a, a company now, um, which is this, uh, you know, idea that no one person, no one group is capable of understanding the whole uh, in terms of some of these larger uh, simulation projects. Um, and I think, you know, as we're trying to do uh, with the human brain projects, uh, both in Europe and, uh, and in the U.S., we are really getting to the point where no one human, no one individual is going to be able to understand the whole. Um, and so this is where uh, a lot of the collaboration really comes into play. And I think that again, you have hit on something extraordinarily important and uh, something that will be more and more important as we move forward uh, in this kind of simulation um, environment where you really need the tools uh, to be good enough so that experts uh, who are experts in different, you know, aspects of a particular problem uh, would be able to fill the information uh, in and interrogate the system that someone else is interrogating at the same time from a different perspective. Um, so I wonder if your, you know, talk really uh, should have been renamed the uh, fourth paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, I, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're cut from the same cloth here. So it's no uh, surprise that we're speaking uh, the same language uh, on that. Um, yeah, I, 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 I share that idea. I mean, things like the virtual fly brain uh, are a really great example of that. Um, uh, you know, there's at least a dozen different data sets that are all integrated uh, into a tool like that. And um, while it's done a very good job of provenance tracking um, and, and letting you get back to the, you know, the original papers, if you want to fully understand all those data sets, like you have to read a lot of papers. Um, and, um, and so to even just be able to like touch that data and get a sense of it to begin with, to start your exploration uh, can be really powerful and much more powerful than 
sitting down with the stack of papers and trying to put it all into your brain. You're like, okay, yeah, but let me, let, what's actually in this data set? How does it fit together with other things? Um, so um, yeah, the diversity of observations here is, is massive. And um, uh, so we, we think that it, it's a space that naturally has a lot of complex software problems in it. And um, yeah, and we're seeing some of these tools, you know, beginning to really um, reach in and try to, and try to tackle them. Um, so yeah, agreed. Awesome. So um, it, does anyone else have questions? Clearly, Tom is not on the line. Stephen. No, no, I do. I do have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tom. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing? Good, um, good. The um, so I know you didn't you didn't talk a lot about this in your presentation, but um, when when working with vocabularies, um, in my mind, again, sort of starting at the same place that you've started, be, being a little bit behind in time, um, the foundation for many of the collaborations, most of that communication, that great diagram that you showed of what it takes to really make a brain atlas. Um, how, how do you communicate to people about how important it is to have computationally accessible vocabularies as a foundation for their communication? Yes. So, um, um, uh, it, what we find is that um, in some of the applications that we're asked to build, it's extraordinarily important. Um, however, surprisingly to, uh, to us and me, who have come from you know, the same place that you are, um, it's also possible to do a lot of great things with a pretty minimal vocabulary. And I know that may be a little bit, uh, you know, um, uh, maybe committing a, a grave sin, uh, to say here, but um, but there are some times where the practicalities outweigh, you know, having it right. So, I mean, I think the counterpoint really is if you look at something like Virtual Flybrain, because what they're doing is doing so much detailed integration, there it's really critical that you've got the underlying, um, you know, ontologies and vocabularies. From the software world, of course, um, there's a perspective where this is, where ontology is just kind of a different form of data model. So sometimes it tends to go under the framework of, well, just how much of a sophisticated data model do we need exactly? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I well know the arguments for why um, ontologies are, are so critical. But, in the, so in the case of virtual flybrain, it's, it's really in, important. Um, you need to be able to do that kind of query. Uh, but, um, you know, a project like HM uh, is actually very light on, on vocabularies, as it turns out because it's a very image-based, it's a very image-heavy um, uh, application. And what it's really just doing is just trying to present the data holdings. And it's um, almost like a sophisticated book, um, if you will. In fact, we use that, that metaphor um, in the building of it, that it's sort of like a virtual book. And so, you know, it could be like a Paxinos atlas uh, in a way that uh, the purpose is to see the data. Um, and so there's really not even a search. Uh, on that on that environment and that's what you know that's what that group wanted uh, in that case now I share the vision of at some point having all data connected uh, with uh, one master of vocabulary and ontology to rule them all and you guys know I mean I did this is, this is part of my dissertation and that is something that we can do but I think the um, it's equally important also that when it's just important to get data out um, so that people can see it, or it's important to have a tool that lets people interoperate um, to make sure that that uh, that level of project success is um, is kept as the highest priority. So, yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Yeah, if, um, I'll wait and see if somebody else has another question because I have a follow up. Sure. All right, I will ask my follow-up. Um, the um, so when when you have a single data set like HM, where you're not trying to integrate across multiple different labs, I can totally understand that. Um, is there an opportunity to talk about balancing the need for a full ontology versus as you know a lexicon, as you basically articulated in in your work? Um, 
previously, is there an opportunity to make that integrating at, at that lexical level um, easier so that you don't even have to have a question about, well, do I want to include this or not? No, we're just, when we, when we have whatever even minimal vocabulary we have for something like an HM project, it's still mapped into that common language, which is not just English or not just neuroscience English. Yeah. So, um, um, so there, there are, there are actually some, some larger scale projects that we're starting to work on now that, um, where this is going to be really critical. So I'll sort of put the hat on for, um, projects like that. Um, one of the things I sort of mentioned it quickly with the virtual fly brain was the way that query, the needs, the actual user uh, needs for querying drove the need for the ontology and drove the need for the ontology to be implemented in the way it was implemented. Now there, instead of using, you know, a reasoner, um, there, there's a combination between a system called Aberowl and Neo4j. Um, and um, why I'm mentioning those technologies is that, um, that when the focus is on what are the scientific questions that are gonna, that are gonna get asked, or at least what's the range of scientific questions that could get asked. It makes, it, it, it uh, sets the boundaries and constraints around how detailed, how many relationships, what relationships, how computable are the relationships um, that um, are easy to um, lose sight on when the main focus is on, you know, from, from the ontology perspective is just connecting, just connecting data in general with the hope or idea that, that we'll be able to make you know, the most use of it down the road. Now, I think that's still critically important, but what I'm saying here is that for us, we're very much driven by the use cases. So, you know, again, some of these large scale projects really are starting to say, yeah, no, I wanna, you know, I wanna be able to build these kinds of visualizations across even more uh, data, data types and even more integrated. And you know, I wanna ask really sophisticated questions about exactly where are things located and exactly how do they overlap and how do they relate to each other. Well, there you go. I mean, that's, that's, the, need for, that's the need for ontology. Um, so it's really driven by user need is kind of what I wanna, wanna. Perfect. Um, yeah, thank so you. So Stephen, thank you so much again. Um, I think we are out of time at this point and I just wanted to um, plug the whole series uh, uh, where um, we have a lot of different um, simulation uh, folks and, and a lot of people have, who have uh, talked to us about ontologies and other um, basically tools that, uh, that neuroscientists really need. Um, so uh, again, uh, thank you very much, Stephen, and we will try to put this up on YouTube in the foreseeable, uh, very near future. Uh, and thank you all very much for joining us, um, and we hope to see you on YouTube. Terrific. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.